we are at the end of the book of Genesis. This is our study about Yosef and Yeshua Messiah, session 9. And we are going to be doing Genesis chapters 49 and 50, and that will wrap up for our book of Genesis study. At the end, I will take just a moment to discuss with you where we're going next, and uh, that, that should be fun too. So with that said, let us begin with Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. It says, And Jacob called his sons and said to them, Gather, and I will tell you what will meet you at the end of days. Convene and hear, sons of Jacob, and hearken to Israel your father. <clears throat> Reuben, my firstborn, <clears throat> you are my vigor and the beginning of my virility with a surplus for bearing and a surplus of strength. Turbulent as water, you must not have a surplus. For up you went to the bed of your father. Then you violated my couch to which you went up. Simeon and Levi are brothers. <coughs> Instruments of violence are their weapons. Into their deliberation you must not come, my soul. And into their assembly you must not contend, my glory. For in their anger they killed men, and for their pleasure they uprooted a chief. Cursed is their anger, for it was strong, and for their rage, for it was obstinate. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. <clears throat> now, I want to just say a couple of words. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm sucking mass amounts of power here. Yeah, I'll turn that off. Um, I want to just say a couple of words, first of all, because... I know, as you guys have probably discovered, if you've been reading this and researching this last section in the book of Genesis, it is incredibly difficult. It is not only incredibly difficult to understand, it's incredibly difficult to translate. Uh, all of the, the, the Hebrew commentaries, uh, I don't really bother much with Christian commentaries, but the, the Hebrew commentaries on this section of Scripture are not only all over the place, but they will readily tell you that, that many, many of the words that are used in this section of Scripture can be interpreted multiples of ways. And so what I just read to you might seem very different from what was in your Bible as, as you were listening to what I was reading. Did you? How many of you found that to be the case? It's very, very difficult interpretation of this section. And so I just wanted to... <coughs> just up front say that this section is very challenging. It is a very challenging section, and not only for interpretation, but for understanding. And so prophecy, as a general rule in my own experience, and I'm sure many of yours as well, is rather enigmatic and difficult to ascertain. And there's a lot of metaphoric language, uh, figures of speech and allegory, uh, which can make it very difficult to understand. Uh, let me ask you what your, your opinion or feeling is about this subject, uh, about the purpose of prophecy. What do you believe is the purpose of prophecy, and why is prophecy so many times not <coughs> terribly clear? Sometimes what do you believe the now. purpose of it is? <clears throat> Sorry? Sometimes it's not for you now when you get prophecy. It's for something down the road, and it makes more sense. Sure, yeah, it's absolutely. Past present or future. Right. Okay. So do you, uh, <coughs> what do you believe that is the purpose of prophecy? Foreshadowing. Or tell some. Well, y yes. I mean, prophecy obviously is a, a uh, in, you know, many instances a foreshadowing or a foretelling of what will happen in the future, but what is its purpose for the, for the people? Uh, well, Keith? If, if, uh, <coughs> if you find, if you're reading scripture and you find some <coughs> prophecy that has been fulfilled, it reestablishes or confirms your faith in yeah. Yahovah that you know he does control time and the future and the past and all yeah. the time so so I, I I hear you yeah I hear you 100 percent Jerry it's a glimpse of the future but in uh Amos 3 6 I believe it is is uh God through Amos says that he will not do anything without first uh, revealing it Without revealing it first to a prophet to the future. That's one of the tests that I always use between the New Testament and the Old Testament. When someone says, like the Sabbath has been done away with, show me that prophecy in the Old Testament. Yeah. Not there. Good so point. obviously it's not been done away with. <coughs> yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. In fact, it says in the Greek, the New Testament, 
that we should be diligent to enter into that rest in Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, did you want to say something? And maybe that's the point of prophecy for the time frame in which it's, it's you know, entered that for comfort and guidance for yeah. persons of, of the time. Right. Like I, referring to the end of days. Right. And yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think um, that it's really important to remember what, you know, what Keith said and Jerry and also, you know, Alan, Daryl there, <coughs> that, that the, you know, it really does, it strengthens our faith in our Father. It also strengthens our faith in the Word yeah. that you can see by reading this Word that it is absolutely true and that this is a true written Word and this is a true uh, testimony and that our Father is, you know, absolutely true. And what He says comes to pass every time. Uh, Johan, nothing? Okay. I got something. Yes, sir? So this first part before He gets into each of the sons... Yes. Uh, I find it interesting that he, he's telling them to gather and he's going to tell them what will happen in the end days. Right. And whether these things have happened all, already completely or they're still going to happen, it's this gathering of the house of Israel that's going to make all of these things unfold. Excellent. And the, the key pieces in here are hearken and listen. It's Shema, hear and obey, do these things. Yes, absolutely. Good, good point. That uh, this has to do with the con con the convocation and the gathering together of the sons of Israel to, to hear about what is happening with them, and it is for uh, you know as you can see the, the end of days. Now, like you said, can you look in the last you know three thousand five hundred years of human history and see some of these prophecies unfolding? Absolutely, you can. Does that mean that they're done? and that they've already been fulfilled and they will not be fulfilled again? Absolutely not. I mean, how many of you guys view prophecy in the Bible as cyclical? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it can be fulfilled one way, and then it fulfilled again, and then fulfilled it again. And, and, and my own understanding and interpretation of some scriptures, when I see a prophecy that can be fulfilled, it's fulfilled in a way, and then it's fulfilled again in a bigger way, and then it's fulfilled again in an even bigger way, and it's all kind of leading up, you know, it's like a, a giant spiral that just keeps getting bigger. So, I just wanted to touch briefly, bless you, on this idea of prophecy, because first of all, yes, this is going to be really challenging, and second of all, just to kind of clarify in our own minds, what is this for? It's, it's clearly, what is it, let me just throw, throw this out there. Would you say that it was definitely not so that you can know the future? No. Do you think it's important that God, think, do you believe that God believes it's important for you to know the future? Pretty much. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. <coughs> Tracy? And I think that also, I'm very not, I don't, understand a lot of this, but I can see some of it in other places in the Bible, so I think like specifically with Benjamin, when we get to that, mm. it calls them this wolf tearing the prey, and if you that reference is used throughout the Old Testament, mm -hmm. so you can go, oh, I'm just talking about Benjamin right here. Right. So I think if we pay attention to some of these descriptions, we'll probably see them hidden throughout the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Jerry? Another thing, I think that uh, it teaches us to keep your eyes on Yeshua. Mm-hmm. You, if you know that he's going to win, and the back of the book says he is going to win, uh, then you've got hope. Yes. So in a general uh, sense, you know the future. Winner. You know how the story ends. Yeah. But it's not necessarily that you know exactly what's going to happen at what time. And Ezekiel 38 39 doesn't sound like much fun. No, it, it does not. It has not happened yet, and I'm not sure when it's going to happen. That's an interesting <laughs> idea, Andrew. Anya? It also shows the connections why things are happening. Each prophet, he doesn't just say this is going to happen. He says because mm -hmm. you did this, mm -hmm. Good this point. is going to happen. And I think it's important for us to understand the connections. Yes, that's a brilliant point. To make sure that you understand what when something is being prophesied, why is it being prophesied? What is the purpose of it? That's an excellent consideration. Excellent. Um, so let's. You have to, why did you have to spend 400 years <coughs> in Egypt? Why do you have to have a Messiah, someone come right. and die for you? Right, absolutely, yeah. incredibly important. Why are you scattered amongst the nations? Yep. Me and my tribes. That's right. 
That's right. Good point. Excellent point. Um, so we'll start with Reuben. Now, Reuben, um, we will, I want to examine just a couple of scriptures for Reuben because it says about Reuben that he is the firstborn and the beginning of his strength. I think we understand what is being said there. Um, with a surplus for bearing and a surplus of strength, a turbulent as water. You must not have a surplus, for up you went to the bed of your father, and you violated his couch. What you, we 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 know what he's talking about there. Yeah, he went with Bilha. His wife. Bilha, yeah, he apparently <coughs> bedded his father's wife, and that is clearly verboten. That's not a good idea, um, and it, it it obviously affected his father quite a bit. He was not happy about that. I mean, in the Torah, will come along. 400 years later and clearly delineate, you know, the relationship, sexual relationships between family members is not good. Uh, but clearly I think that even before the Torah was given, that principle was still in place because it was just clearly identified as this is not a good thing. And so I, and I believe that that is because, you know, he lost his preeminence as a firstborn son because of that act and uh, lost that position. And I think that you can see uh, through the history of this tribe and this son of Reuben of perhaps him trying to get back his position <coughs> that he lost. Uh, what I'd like us to do briefly is take a look at uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 32. If you look at Numbers 32, I just want to take a, a brief survey of some of the information about Reuben. We'll start in Numbers 32, starting in verse 1, and we'll just go to verse uh, 5. It says, The abundance of cattle which the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had came to be very substantial. Now they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for cattle. So the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moshe, to Eliezer the priest and to the princes of the congregation, saying, Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Namra, Heshbon, Eliela, Shibam, Nebo, and Beon, the land which Yuvah smote before the congregation of Israel, it is cattle land, and your servants have cattle. And they also said, If we have found favor in your eyes, let this land be given to your servants for a holding. Do not make us cross over this Jordan. Are you guys familiar with this story? You familiar with this, what's happening here? Remember, remember when they first came up along the, uh, the eastern side of the Jordan River and they conquered those two kings? Quiz, anybody remember the names of the two kings that they conquered? Og and Bashan. Sihon and Og. Good job, good job. <laughs> And that, that land was really good for cattle. And of course, these two tribes, the sons of Gad and Reuben, are saying, we'd like to go ahead and stay here on this side of the Jordan. They did not want to cross over the Jordan and go into the other. Well, I mean, the whole thing is the promised land. Because remember, you remember the boundaries of the promised land? Where does it go? The Euphrates to the Nile. From the Euphrates to the Nile, from the sea to the sea. So all of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, all of it, all of it is the land of Israel. Now at this time, and he said, I'm not going to, you know, give you the whole land all at once because you won't be, you don't have enough people to fill it up and, you know, the wild animals will multiply and it'll be in trouble yeah. for you. So, but he wanted them in this centralized location and also to take care of these people whose abominations had become full and they needed to be removed, those seven nations that were established in the land of Canaan. And so these guys, Reuben and his brother Gad and their tribes decided, well, we want to stay on the east side of the Jordan and they did not want to cross over. What does that suggest to you? Anything? It's almost like they were kind of separating themselves from their brethren a little bit. Well, what, I mean, if you're on the other side of the Jordan River and you're in the land of Bashan and, 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 and the Amorites... Uh, what are you going to be susceptible to? 
you could be attacked by other peoples coming from the east. I mean, the Jordan River is going to be a natural <clears throat> defensive barrier against people coming in from the east to raid you guys. So that wouldn't make them entirely safe. What would be their motivation for wanting to stay on the other side of the river? The land was very fertile. Okay. It was very good land. It was good and fertile land, but is it the land that Yuvah had wanted them to move into? That was irrelevant to them. It was, it was irrelevant to them. Good point. Good point. It was irrelevant to them. And I think that, how, how do, well, do, do you believe that that somehow relates to what, he's, what uh, Jacob is saying of his firstborn son here, um, that he must not have a surplus? And that the strength would be removed somehow. Does, does that relate to you in any way between these two things? I know it's kind of a s tangential at best, but I just wondered if you saw anything important in that section. Jerry? I don't know. I'd say he was a very carnal man. He uh, carnal meaning of the flesh. Of the flesh. Little greed, things, mm -hmm. possessions. He saw it. He wanted he it. Saw, he saw it. He wanted it. Just yeah. like he did with his wife. Just and like with his wife. The carnal yeah. and the spirit kind of don't get along. I agree. Like a negative and a positive. Yeah. And, yeah. It's well, like opposite ends of it. Went through my mind. <coughs> narcissistic. A little bit narcissistic. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that's an interesting, interesting, um, Oops. interesting thing. Um, yeah, going crazy. Uh, I want to just look at one other one and look at what happens in Josh in the book of Joshua. This is very interesting. If you look at Joshua chapter twenty-two. Joshua chapter 22, start in verse 10. Joshua 22.10 says that uh, they came into the districts of the Jordan, which are in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, a great altar for appearance, and the sons of Israel heard about it, saying, Lo, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh have built the altar over against the land of Canaan on the districts of the Jordan at the passage of the sons of Israel. And the sons of Israel here and all the company of the sons of Israel uh, assembled at Shiloh to go up against them to war. And the sons of Israel sent unto the sons of Reuben and unto the sons of Gad and unto the half the tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, uh, Phineaser, uh, Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and ten princes with him, one prince, one prince for a house of a father for all the tribes of Israel, and each of them a head of a house of, for their fathers for the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead and spoke with them, saying, Thus said all the company of Yahweh, What is this trespass which you have trespassed against the Elohim of Israel to turn back today after Yuvah by your building for you yourself an altar for your rebelling today against Yuvah? In the iniquity of Peor, little to us, from which we have not been cleansed till this day, and the plague is in the company of Yuvah, that you turn back today from after Yuvah, and it has been... You rebel today against Yuvah, and to tomorrow against all the company of Israel, he is wroth. Do you see what they're doing here? Did you, did you catch that? What is Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh doing on the other side of the Jordan River? Doing things their own way. They're building their own altar. They got their own altar to the Father over on the other side. Now, what, do you remember the story? What did they say? What was their explanation? Well, what they said was, well, we're not going to do any uh, sacrifices here. This is just kind of a, you know, it's like a memorial, you know. We're not going to worship you ah, here. It's just a, you know, it's just a place for us to memorialize what you guys have on the other side of the Jordan. Is that, is that a problem? That is definitely a problem. I mean, they can't. You can't just do that. I mean, Moses had already instructed them. You may not just set up altars in your backyard or wherever the heck you'd like. You know, it's in the place where I designate for my name to be. And so we can see 
rebellion. This kind of yeah, this rebellious attitude, and this is this is obviously you know what five hundred years later after this prophecy is spoken by Jacob that that son is still having trouble years and years later that it he that spirit of rebellion that spirit of covetousness i want this fancy land and i want this i want my own altar because i it, it's kind of like they're separating themselves from the other sons of israel and that is uh, you know it's kind of portrayed here and it is going out into the future and uh, they may not have wanted to fight to all of the yeah, you know, the other groups that were out the Parasites and the Hittites, right? And the yeah, yeah. And the all the Yanks, yes. Right. Oh. Yeah, that was a problem there too, and I think that was in the section coming up on in, in Judges. But I, I don't want to go there and spend too much time just on this one son. But yes, I mean when they were going over the land, they were like, "Yeah, you can guys find the father says you guys can stay here." But you can't just stay. You have to send your men over with us to fight. You may leave your women and children and your cattle in this land and build some houses and pens and everything, but you guys have to fight. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to fight. And they did. They did. They went at the head of the army. They had strong men, and they fought. But you can see an attitude of covetousness here, that he really is coveting some things, and his heart doesn't appear to be in the right place. You can see the crossing of the hands. The blessing from Manasseh and the Priam. Yes. Like, yep. <laughs> absolutely. Why Manasseh or Manasseh received the lesser blessing? Yeah. Yeah, because he's throwing his lot in kind of with his brothers on the other side of the Jordan, which is not good. Um, now, I want to just spend a moment on um, Simeon and Levi. He talks about them being violent. And your reading in your text may say that in their anger they killed men and then, then hamstrung an ox. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is again dealing with the strange interpretations of some of these words and why this is such a difficult passage for the translators and for us to understand. But of course you can see why and you know you, you, you guys are probably familiar by now that I'm using the concordant literal version in our texts here. That an ox and a chief. Do you see the connection there? How would they? How would this this translation sit? Huh? It's a leader. So yeah, with a hamstrung an ox. Do we know any story where they were, you know, mean to animals? I don't really have anything. There's nothing in the Torah that I'm aware of where where Simeon and Levi were were you know being brutal to animals. What do we know about them and violence? The Dina situation. They city. The rape of their sister Dinah, and Dina, when they all. slaughtered all the men of Shechem. Yeah. And war that, in their anger, they killed men, and for their pleasure, they uprooted a chief. Yeah. That would be Shechem and his son Hamor. Or was it the other way around? I'm not sure. But I think that that's more likely what they're talking about. So when your text says that he ha they were hamstringing oxen, it doesn't seem to make mm -hmm. as much sense as uprooting a chief. If you look at the text, that you can interpret that way. And it <coughs> makes a little bit more sense in the historical context. Um, now, what's interesting, too, and I know that you guys may have... Um, he, he seems to want to separate them and disperse them in Israel because he doesn't want them banding together. Because they're all bad. Be, because they're violent. And their violent is, is really, they can get really worked up and do crazy stuff. Now, have any of you read the book of Jasher? The book of Jasher has a rather lengthy section talking about what happened when the men of Shechem, or that, that uh, Hamor raped their daughter, the daughter, their sister Dinah, and what these sons did, it's absolutely crazy. If you read that section in the, in the, in the, in the regular Hebrew Bible, it's just a you know, paragraph. But in the book of Jasher, it's got like two or three chapters detailing what they did with Shechem. And it, it, it almost reads like a comic book. These guys are like supermen. I mean, they were fighting, you know, one of the brothers, Simeon, would fight an entire army of like 200 guys and wipe them out. It, it reads like a comic book. 
they think they're like Batman and Spider-Man. I mean, they're just, they're, they're running and knocking over buildings and they're leaping over walls and doing really crazy stuff. It's well, pretty. One of the giants, one of the uh, giant uh, people. Doesn't seem that way. You mean talking about the sons of Israel? Yeah, they, <coughs> if you're saying Jeshua, I never Well, it them. actually says that they fought some of those people, yeah. that some of the guys that they fought were giant guys. Um, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. If you want to have an interesting read, read the account of the sons of, of Israel wiping out Shechem and all of the others, some of the other towns around there in the book of Jasher. Very interesting. It really gets to the just massive amounts of violence that these guys wreaked on this place. Did they say the ones that got circumcised? Yeah. Yes. They said, you can't marry our sister unless you get circumcised. And then, of course, when they're down and out, they slaughter them. So, now, I don't know, I don't know if you have heard this before, but I actually heard this, and I have not yet found any evidence that this might be the case. I do know that... There were a lot of our Jewish brethren from whatever tribe I don't know that were involved in the development of nuclear weapons. There are conspiracy theories out there that are kind of interesting to read that suggest that descendants of the tribe of Simeon and Levi were responsible for building nuclear weapons. I thought that was kind of interesting. And they seem to have... The designers of it were... They were Jewish. Yeah, Oppenheimer. Yeah, Oppenheimer. And it's, it's clear to me that there were plenty of Jews involved in the development of nuclear fission and atomic weapons, hydrogen weapons. That much is clear. Whether you can tie them to the sons of Simeon and Levi is a little less clear, but it's certainly possible. An interesting conspiracy theory. So well, I'll leave that there. The, the violence part, you know, they use the, in the scripture is Hamas. 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 What do you know about them familiar? apples? Uh, means violence. You don't say. <laughs> Isn't that a quinky well, thing? That's interesting when you read it that way. Their weapons are instrumental of Hamas, like what you just said. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, so I'm going to move forward a little bit, and we're going to Genesis 49, verses 8 through 21. Yes, sir. A quick question, then. Yes. First of all, I just heard Jesher is not in the Bible. So. No, no, it's not. Okay, I didn't know. That's one of those apocryphal works. Yeah. Question about Lephi. We were talking about it earlier. That is from the Lephi, uh, Lephatic race then, right? The, Le the, Le the Levitical priesthood of the tribe of Levi? Yes. Yes. So he was a bad brother then as well. Well, and he became actually then the altar. Uh, well, think about something. Life. Some think sir, think about something. I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, I think that deserves a moment of coverage. That y you can see that the br these two brothers are uh, violence and wrath is d ascribed to them. Yeah. Now, are they evil? Are they bad? I don't know that you can you can say that. I mean, what Yeshua comes back, is he wrathful and vengeful and destroys a bunch of stuff? Yes, he does. Is he evil? No, he's not. Now, he is a righteous judge, and he does what is right, and I think that we could make a case more strongly that Yeshua has a right to do, to do what he does. Now, these men, they're that man who raped their sister Dinah, did he deserve to be cut down? Yes. Absolutely. Did all the men of Shechem deserve to be cut down? Probably not. <laughs> no. Probably not. However, again, if you read the book of Jasher, they had in that town, all of the leaders and the elders knew what had happened. And they did nothing because they were playing favorites. There was a, I mean, it's the king's son that raped this girl. And they were they refused, almost like Sodom and Gomorrah, there's gross injustice. Everyone knew what they had what this man had done to their sister, but they did not intervene to help her and they did not stand up 
to the leadership to say what you have done is wrong. And so the brothers interpreted that as this whole town is full of evil people and they all deserve to die because they did not, it's almost like the Good Samaritan law or something. They, they weren't commanded by y'all to put the town under the ban. Right. Which they, meant everything right. died. Right, yes. Yeah. So they took it upon themselves. Now, can you say that some of those, those people were guilty of not interfering and helping the girl or you know, condemning their leader? Absolutely. Does that mean they all need to be slaughtered? I don't mm -hmm. believe the Torah teaches that. Association. Yeah, you, there's no commandment that or command to do it. Then, then you don't do it. And they went against Yahweh. Exactly. Well, if you think about a priest's duty, which is slaughtering stuff all day long, maybe it kind of works for Levi to do it if he's already got that. Part. Well, and that's uh, <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, hold on. Hold on a second, Jerry. When you go back to the golden calf. Yes. When, Mo when Moses came down, the yes. only people that stood with Moses were really, the tribe of Levi, and after they had the trial of the bit of water, it was 3,000 people that survived when the Levites cut them down, killed them. That's right, because that's Moses said, the, the every of one of you exactly. strap on your sword and go back and forth in the camp and kill your brother and your uh, sister. You know, I read that to the kids yeah. a couple of weeks back, and they were like, Does that, what, they were just killing everybody? I'm like, yeah. no, everybody else God did not them send them willy-nilly through the camp to just kill everybody you see. I do not, that would not be right. What they did, in, according to my reading of the text, is that they killed everyone who were the instigators and the people who set up the idol and were actually threatening Aaron and her with death if they did not do it. And of course, you're getting that from the Mishnah and the Targums of Jonathan and some of the extra biblical literature that you can read that find, to find out a little bit more details. Tracy? I haven't read this story with Dinah in a while, but did they actually? Did he actually rape her? Because the the yes. text that I saw says he humbled her. No. I or believe that that. Did. My understanding <clears throat> is that he did. Because yes. the word hum, "ana" is the same word when God tells us to afflict our souls on the Day of Atonement. Yes. So I'm but I, but there are that. several instances in the Torah where it is talking about humbling a woman, especially uh, in relation, like when you took a um, a woman in war. And you, you had to shave her head and cut her nails and change her clothes, and then you may uh, sleep with her. It also talks of humbling. Mm -hmm. So, in a in a sense, I thought perhaps because it was out of wedlock that that was the humiliation. The, the word anah is is more properly translated as a submission. Mm -hmm. Okay, a total submission. Mm -hmm. So when you submit your nephesh, your soul, to the Father Yahweh. Right. As we're called to do in, in uh, Yo Yo Kaki mm -hmm. but I would think it in the same way. You know, mm -hmm. she was there, she was uh, submitted to him completely, right. and not of her own that, volition. Mm -hmm. It seems to it seems clear to me. I would <laughs> probably have to read it again to make sure. That is a good question. I can't say definitively, but that is my understanding. I remember reading it before and kind of struggling with this chapter because I was like. Sounds like he really loved this girl, you know, mm. and, and mm. I don't know, I just kind of... Well, he professed his love for her quite <laughs> profoundly. I think he lusted after her. I think it was lust. lust. Yeah. That, that was my interpretation. Is uh, You know, I mean, he had already, if he had already raped her and humbled her, and then he's like, I love this woman, I want to marry her, it's like, well, the sex couldn't have been that good. <laughs> I mean, she was, un, she was an unwilling partner. She was a virgin, yes, of course. They but virgins. For some reason, yeah, 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 I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that would think they would have been approved by the father. Yeah, and in the Torah we have, you know, a father, you know, having a say in, in who the daughter is marrying. Yeah, so that's absolutely true. Uh, so I'm going to move forward a little bit to Genesis 49, 8 through 21. Now this says... This is the, I have broken apart the section with Judah and then Zebulun and Dan and Asher. Um, so we'll, do a, we'll deal with Judah first. Judah, your brothers will acclaim. Your hands shall be on the scruff of your enemies. The sons of your father shall bow to you. The cub of a lion is Judah. For a prey, my son has gone up, crouching as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not withdraw from Judah, nor a ruler's staff from between his feet, till Shiloh come. And to him shall be the expectation of the peoples. He binds his colt to a vine, 
and to a choice vine the foal of his donkey. He rinses his clothing in wine, and then the blood of grapes his covering. His eyes are flushed with wine, and his teeth white from milk. Zebulun shall tabernacle at a port of the seas, and at a port for ships with its flank unto Sidon. Issachar covets pleasantness. He will recline between the hearthstones, and see a resting place that is good, and a land that is pleasant. Yet he will stretch out his shoulder for a burden, and he will become a servant under a labor levy. Dan shall adjudicate his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall become a serpent on a way, a horned snake on a path that bites the heels of a horse, and its rider shall fall backwards. Your salvation I await, Yuvah. Gad, a raiding party, shall raid him, yet he shall raid their heels. Asher, his bread shall be stout, and he will provide royal luxuries. Naphtali is an oak stretched out, the giver of products that are seemly. So we got a huge list of several brothers here. Yes, sir. Okay, so for Naphtali, you've got an oak. I've got is a doe set free that has beautiful fawns. That is definitely different, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> that is definitely... Does anyone have any comment on that? What is what? Is, uh, let's let's check out um, Tracy. What would you? What does yours say about Naphtali in verse twenty-one? Uh, oh, mine says Naphtali is a deer let loose, giving one beautiful things. A deer. Okay, so now um, I'm going to look. I'm just going to look in the Hebrew and see, does anyone have their Hebrew handy that wants to look at that word for oak or deer or whatever it is? <laughs> you don't have any oak here. Oak and deer are two different things. I don't know these, some of these words, so uh, it says this is a doe being set free, the one who bears fawns, or one who bears beautiful fawns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I see it's mm -hmm. ayala, ayala. Right. Uh, so. Doe. Deer, hind, I really have no idea why the concordant literal version decided to translate that as oak. Mm -hmm. Like this deer in the forest and female. <laughs> that could be. That could be. Uh, stretched out. This says let loose, it's which because is. Because of the root word it comes from is Aiel. Shalak. Which is. That's something strong, a pilaster, oak tree, rather strong tree. Okay, so the root word <laughs> has to do with. The oak. Mm -hmm. The oak. So this is Ayala is the female version of Ayal, which is the male deer, and then that root word is Ayil, which is the root the oak. No idea how that's connected. Yeah, I don't I don't either. Um, <laughs> do you see that it, it makes a difference one way or the other whether it's an oak or a deer? Well, it's, it's drawing on strength. I think that the root word kind of explains it. It compares it to a ram. You think about a ram and the strength of its head. Okay. So I think perhaps we're going with some sort of... A doe, well, this must be a strong doe. <laughs> a uh, yeah, a doe <laughs> wouldn't exactly be a strong animal that you wouldn't... You wouldn't it's more graceful. Well, you, it's graceful, know, yeah. People that are deer. Sounds like a deer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Do, you know, do, do all of your, in the latter part of verse 21, do all of your, uh, your interpretations in your scriptures talk about products that are goodly? Yes, beautiful, beautiful words. words. Yeah. See, ours says beautiful fawns. <laughs> beautiful beautiful fawns. fawns. And it's a, it is a doe set free that has beautiful fawns. Well, now the word is a mere, which is utterance, speech, words, sayings, promises, commands. So it's not products. At least not that I can see, unless there's some root there that I'm missing. So he is Nathan putting well, it could forth. Have a different meaning too. It could mean challenge. Yeah, some of the some of the words do have dual meanings. Okay, so this is the original from eight, Hebrew five five nine, which is um, Amar, which is also to say, speak, or utter. Right. So why was it? So I don't know why they put in. He doesn't specifically say it's just a deer. 
they're let loose. Like it's so you, you we're running into what I spoke of earlier in regards to how difficult these portions are to translate. I don't know yeah. why this is so difficult, but it's, it is. Yeah. We're seeing it right now with stuff just not exactly. It has to do with the translators. Or so That's why learning these Hebrew words when you know, when we get into really learning a lot of the Hebrew words, I spend so much time on pages of Hebrew words, and what it comes out when you put the literal meanings in there. A lot of times it's so different from right. what English translators do. Right, right, absolutely. Um, well, I'm, yes, sir. I think also for um, we're using so much like deer, like you have the lion, you have serpents, of course, that, that's a pretty clear one. Deer. Sure, yeah. So I think there definitely must be a reason also for why you use it. Seems animals. animal would be better than an oak tree. That's certainly yeah. possible. It seems to be more in line with what is said about yeah. the other brothers, so I, I think I agree. Uh, alone. Alone? Alone. Oak tree. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so I'm going to back up to Judah and say here, um, when did Judah... Now this seems to be indicating a certain uh, rulership, leadership position that will be given to Judah. Is that fairly clear from your translations? That he's got a ruler's staff from between his feet and a scepter. Uh, Shiloh is also an interesting translation there. Not Nobody's really sure what that means, but I think that from the words that come after that, you can kind of see that that's referring to the Messiah. Okay. Now, when, as we can see that he does have a leadership and rulership position, when does he actually begin to rule his brothers? Do you know when that happens in relation to this time frame? Do you know that who who was the uh, who who from the tribe of Judah became a leader? David. David. Yeah, that would have been almost 650 <coughs> years later. So, and and from the time of David, you would really have a leader of from the tribe of Judah that was ruling at least those two or three or four tribes from that southern region all the way until Shiloh came. From the time of the Messiah. Now the question is, why do you think that Judah was given this position until Shiloh came? And of course, what happened to his leadership position after Shiloh came? Well, Judah was was through David. Yeah. But then it was because of Shlomo or King Solomon and his sin, it was broken. Right. The rulership with Yeroboam and Rehoboam. So it was split. Right. That's when you had the split. Right. So this rule of Judah didn't really come back <clears throat> until 721 B.C. after the Assyrian captivity when the ten tribes were dispersed. Then, then Yehuda ruled okay. again. I'm just curious about what you might think about why this leadership position was given to Judah, the tribe of Judah, to begin with. Tracy? Well, um, well I, can answer, I, I can try to answer that, but I was just going to say, I think um, it says the lawmaker shall not depart from between his feet. And there's other places in Scripture. About in between the feet? Hmm? Are you talking about between the feet? <clears throat> well, no, just the, the lawmaker. It says the lawmaker will, will not depart from between his feet in my translation. But um, there's other places in Scripture that say Judah is my lawgiver. And it talks about the obedience of the peoples to him. So the, I think the significance is that he, throughout history, <coughs> held this Torah and brought it down. And without Judah, we wouldn't still, we would be lost today without, we wouldn't have it. Yeah. So he's that lawgiver that all throughout history. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Jewish people have been so persecuted, because they're out there in the open with this, with this word of God. And then Messiah comes from the same tribe and passes the baton to him, and he puts it in our hearts. So Excellent. I think it's the significance of Judah having the law. Excellent. So I, I see the significance of, of, of Judah having the law given to them. They are entrusted with the Torah and will carry it forward until Messiah comes. He will then take that same Torah and put it in our hearts mm -hmm. so that we can have it in our hearts, whereas before it was written on stony tablets of dirt and, and rock. <coughs> Jerry? I was just thinking the first three sons had disqualified themselves because of the fact they had dishonored their father. 
All right, Judah was kind of a rebel in the beginning, but when it was all said and done at the end of uh, when the 12 tribes went down into uh, Egypt, he's the one that finally repented. He became the leader of the family. He's the one that bowed before Joseph, and he kind of took over the yeah. Didn't he the uh, kingship. Or the <laughs> yeah, he of offered to give himself so, up for his brother. Just maybe God rewarded him because of his that's, humility at that point. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I was looking for was some ideas about maybe why you know <laughs> Judah had been selected, and I think that's as good an answer as any is to suggest that you know Judah demonstrated on several occasions throughout this period with Joseph that he was becoming a representative of the family and a representative for repentance and repenting against what they had done to their brother, offering himself for the life of his brothers. So yes, I think that's a good that's a good answer. What about prophetically how that tribe was named? The praise? name of Judah. Judah praise? It's named, yeah. Yahweh Da, meaning uh, a praise to Yahweh. Mm -hmm. All the other names don't seem to have anything. The, the father's in name names, built in there. You know, Is Issachar, Zebulon, God, you know, and so forth. None of the other names of the tribes have that in it. Well, it's certainly, I think you could certainly ascribe some significance to that. That the father's part of the father's name is built right into their to that to that name. You know, praise right. be to Yah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so. That is a complicated subject about what happens at when Shiloh comes and what happens to the tribe of Yehuda when Shiloh does come, when the Messiah comes. We see that Yehuda uh, underwent some severe persecution. Uh, in fact, that persecution started almost immediately after Shiloh died. Messiah died. They were you know, decimated by the Romans and kicked out of their land and scattered across the surface of the planet. And then, of course... That really continued until, I mean, if you've ever done any research into that, that tribe has suffered tremendously over the eons for, you know, a couple thousand years. And it's only been in recent memory that they have begun to stand up for themselves and have a place of their own and kind of come back into their own. I don't think that's an accident. Jerry? Just another thought I had. I don't know if this plays into this or not, but God divorced the ten tribes. Right. He did not divorce Judah. Benjamin and Levi because of the promise that he had made to uh, King David that that his that he would always have a line to the throne. Sure. Now, I don't know if that it was plays with this or not. That's uh, yeah, that's an interesting interesting observation. I know um, yeah, it seems like those tribes had not I mean it's hard to decide though because you can see that the northern ten tribes had really given themselves over. <coughs> Judah was worse. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, but what? But when the father comes against Judah, he seems to actually indicate, you know, that he was even more angry with them because they were pretending, that because they were hypocrites. That you guys have held to a form of godliness, almost like Paul would say. But you know, I would rather that you had just gone the way of the ten tribes and just given yourselves completely over to idol worship than pretend than being halfway. It's like that lukewarm thing that you're talking about in the book of Revelation. It's because of the covenant that he made with David. That's but that covenant, that. yes, I think you're you right. You can't break the covenant because he made the covenant. That's true. He made it. David didn't have anything to do with the covenant more than Abraham did with that covenant. That's God an interesting it, idea. Yeah. God has to bring it to pass. That's an interesting idea in the fact that you've got them seemingly lukewarm and being yeah. actors, hypocrites, and yet we've got this promise given to David, which is like, that's my, that's my people, this is what I'm doing with that family. It's like, but because I have made that promise to, to, to the descendants of David, and I'm going to use that tribe, I can't break that promise, but I will punish you. That's really a difficult, t that's a rock and a hard place to be between, Tracy. I think you hit on something that just clicked was we're kind of lumping them together, but mm. they're not. There's right. some that are that say to be Jews and they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. Interesting. You are the, your father of your father, the devil. Sure. You're not Abraham's seed. He's talking to Jews. So <clears throat> I think he kept that promise with some of them. I think there's, there's going to be a division, the, the true and the false. That's an interesting interpretation of that scripture. I really it's true. could. What? I think I agree. You agree with her? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't know. I, I, that's, other, I've heard that. I don't really know. But on the other hand, the concept of what 
uh, you brought up is so key to Messianic prophecy because everything comes through the house of David. In Zechariah chapter 12 speaks very specifically about the house of David and the descendants of the house of We, as believers in Messiah, Yeshua, become children and descendants uh, brought into that house because Messiah comes out of the house of Yehuda. Right. Here you have the lion, the lion of Yehuda, Revelation chapter 5. Mm -hmm. Talking about you know, the origins of the lion of Yehuda. Mm -hmm. It's another prophecy too, which I won't go into right now. Sure, sure. <laughs> I got you. I got you. End day prophecy, which is amazing. I got you. Um, I'm gonna. Do you have anybody have anything else they want to throw in about the tribe of Judah? For now, okay. I'm just gonna move forward so it doesn't get too late and we run out of time. And, and the other. Um, oh, you go, boy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's only, it's, uh, Romans 11. <clears throat> if their rejection be uh, the salvation, salvation for the world, yeah. meaning of Judah. If Judah's rejection be salvation for the world, what will their fulfillment be in their belief? But resurrection from the dead. Yeah, resurrect. I mean, it's just which is coming, yeah. and thus all Israel will Shall be, be saved. saved. Absolutely. Yeah. Good one. Good and one. Also, Messiah says, "I believe to the woman at the well that you worship." What you you have no idea know. what you're doing. Yeah, and he says salvation is of the Jews. So I think that there's another connection there. Indeed. Also, I had a question. I don't have anybody any ideas. I just kind of popped out when you were reading about Judah. Is that he's compared to three different ages of lion, a whelp, yes. a lioness, and a lion. Indeed. Is there any idea as to what that? Why might don't be? you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> no, do you have an idea? That's an interesting. That's an interesting uh, insight. There is that he. Yes. Does it represent the whole family there? It seems to, but how? How so? Yeah, it's an interesting idea, and, and I'm not sure exactly how, I, I, but that is interesting that it is referencing the lion in three stages of growth. Yeah. Is it the stages of growth? Is it the yeah, I think it's a male, female. Female. Well, yeah, we have a okay. So we, yeah, we have a cub and then a female and a male. Uh, I don't know what the significance of that would be. Uh, do we have uh, any other ideas in that regard? One of them is, is reference to Messiah. The male lion. Yeah. That could certainly be. That's so in Revelation five. It's a good idea. The lion of Judah, who yeah. is worthy to break the seal. When he sure. opens up seals, it's a lion, <coughs> not, not a cub. Sure. So if you were right. to say, the cubs mention elsewhere, yeah. but I don't want to go into that. Yeah, no. So <laughs> if you were to say that uh, the lion would would represent Messiah coming from the tribe of Judah, I think that's a valid argument. Um, so what do you do with the cub and the female? And the fact that it's cub. Female lion. Yeah. There's something about that order that's intriguing. It is intriguing. Female is all represent the Holy Spirit. You're right. Good. You're right. Interesting and, idea. And the, and, and the symbolism here, I mean, we could spend a lot of time on these verses, but speaking of Shiloh, I mean, it talks about until uh, when uh, he comes. Uh, Shiloh being a reference to whom it belongs mm -hmm. or to whom the kingdom belongs and to him will be now this other word I had a big problem even finding this word yeah that's a really difficult Kahat. word it is a reference to um, those in the Levites who take care of the sanctuary that's the only reference I could find they take care of took care of the ark and the tabernacle and the inside parts the menorah and and all of that. So, does it really mean it's translated until the that uh, to him will be the obedience of the Amim of the peoples? Mm -hmm. uh, but then it talks about the tethering of the vine to the <coughs> donkey mm -hmm. of him mm -hmm. to a choicest branch of the colt of the donkey. Does that ring a bell? Yes. And he will wash his garment, and it says in blood. He's trotting the okay, wine the press. Grapes. Yeah. And a robe of him, Isaiah 63, I think it is. Who is this coming from? Bolsra? Basra. Yeah, whose who's garments, garments are, are stained in blood. in blood. Right. That's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, you know, I was going to ask you guys, you know, what, what are you thinking about with the idea of... Um, <clears throat> binding his colt to a vine and his choice vine to the full of his donkey and he's rinsing his clothing in wine and the blood of grapes. 
uh, his covering. I think the blood of grapes his covering is a very interesting tie, interesting tie into the book of Isaiah. Uh, his eyes flushed from wine and his teeth white from milk. What are these imagery? What does this imagery symbolize for you? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> to me, it seems to me that he is. Uh, these are the words that are describing rich <laughs> blessing, richness of blessing. That he is. I mean, in those days, I think you would have realized that wine is a very costly thing and a very precious thing, and this guy's washing his clothes in it. So I think this is talking about. Um, you know, being richly provided. I mean, he's, 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 his eyes are flushed from wine, his teeth white from milk, he washes his clothes. And I, I mean, there's certain prophetic significance there. Right. But I think well, this he's is... so rich that he ties the donkey to the choice vine. It's like, that's not even that great of an animal, but you just have so much money, you can take your worst animal and tie it. To yes, the I think this is really a clear it's reference a also right. to some material <laughs> blessings. Now, I feel like, I don't know, kind of... <clears throat> Not and th there may not be too much weight to it, but just thinking about you know with our culture, you know we even have to get these uh, stereotypes of how Jews you know are rich and they own yep. everything. But well, um, that's that's not a stereotype either. That is generally speaking true. I mean, our brother <laughs> Judah has been materially <laughs> blessed. I mean, if you look at the history of the Middle Ages, all of the European countries would kick the Jews out of their country, and then they would go broke. And they would need people with money, and they would ask them back. They would lo make loans, they just kick them out so they could take their stuff? and then they would kick them out and not pay the loans back. That, they did that repeatedly. England did it. France did it. Germany did it. Switzerland. Switzerland did it. Remember they would the, it, invite. The majority of Jews have always been poor. It's always been a certain segment. True. Who have been who had. It, it, Material it blessings. Very, very, yeah, absolutely. It was done for a reason. And there are some stereotypes, Derek, clearly about right, you know yeah. rich Jews, but, but I, yeah, but that's not <laughs> always the case. I mean, if you look at Russian Jews, I think you could maybe say you know the difference between Russian Jews, perhaps a lot of poverty. Oh, wow. European Jews, maybe not, maybe not as much. It, it, generally speaking, just painting in broad brushstrokes. Tracy. There's two things, um, and I don't know if someone said this or not, and I wasn't paying attention. But you weren't paying attention in class? Uh, about the, uh, well, I was too <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> So he washes his clothes in wine and is covering in the blood of grapes. So that word play between blood and wine, mm -hmm. and in Revelation 19.13, did you already talk about that? Washing his he washes his robe in the blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Yeah, well, we didn't bring that one in, but I think uh, that was the same, I think same, it's the same type of reference from Isaiah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it was like what I mentioned the other day, the two sickles. Yes. That's like the second sickle. Right. When he takes out the rest of the world. Right, right. That's the Messiah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, yeah, go ahead. And then your the second. other thing was, I, I misspoke. I said it was wealth, lion, lioness, because I must be flipped around, but it was actually wealth. Okay, just said it right. I said it right. I said it wrong the first time. So I said, well, lion is lion, but it's wealth, lion, lioness. So I was thinking perhaps that meant wealth like the sun, the first coming, lion, the second coming, lioness, the bride. Hmm. That's what I was seeing. Inside. I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought that could be a connection there. I, I think that's think certainly interesting. Me. Certainly <laughs> interesting. Um, I'm going to move forward from Judah. And we're going to talk just a little bit about um, Zebulun. Now, according to the scholarship, there's Zebulun's land was the territory between the, 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 the Galilee and the Mediterranean, which is interestingly where much of the Messiah's ministry took place when he was on the earth. Uh, do you believe that there's any significance in that? That somehow this tribe of um, Zebulun would become the recipients of the blessings of Messiah as he worked and, and traveled through that region of the Galilee? I think that's possible. I mean, when, it's t when it talks about Zebulun, it just really talks, it seems to be talking about where his place will be and that, and that uh, the, you know, scholars are not really sure about whether this, is this saying that he is gonna be a seafaring people <coughs> or just that his territory <coughs> borders Sidon, which is a, seaport 
Uh, do you, does your text uh, reading <coughs> indicate something different? Okay, yeah, that's a different map than I was looking at in my research this week. That's certainly possible, though. I'm not really sure. Yeah, Sidon, Tyre and Sidon are on the coast of Lebanon. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's just an idea. Just want to throw it out there. Um, what do you think, uh, that what principle can we glean from Issachar's coveting pleasantness and the idea that he became ripe for raiders and would become a servant? Was he lazy? Was he passive? It seems like he was perhaps <coughs> passive and lazy and that he, um, and I don't know, this is just some of the commentary that I read. I don't, I don't have scriptures to back this up, so this would be maybe a note you'd make for yourself and if you want to do a little bit of research regarding um, Issachar, you know, coveting pleasant things and he wants the good things but he doesn't necessarily have to work for them. And that he became um, ripe for raiders, I, I, that may have something to do with where his territory was located and that he was uh, open t on his flank to some of the raiding peoples from the east, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Not really sure. Seems like the biggest thing that's open to raiders is the fact that he's passive. That he, he, you're saying he likes nice things. And I'm thinking that he likes not making any violent anything. So he sits there, and people just carry him off and make him a slave. Mine says bandits. But well, that's something that's just not going to stand up for himself. Yeah, many of the commentaries that I read actually say exactly what you're saying, is yeah. that he just seemed rather passive and was not really aggressive, with, especially in carrying out his duties when assigned by Joshua to go and take care of those peoples in the territory where you're supposed to conquer. He didn't do it. He's kind of decided to kick back and make peace. We cannot also read it that he would, uh, because it also means bond servant, mm. uh, bond servant to uh, Jehovah. Mm. That he's on the opposite, that he's not lazy, but that he actually bows down to Elohim. Well, or is too the, well, no, the language, I think you, you, you could be right that the language is re referencing him being a bond servant, but a bond servant to whom? And I don't know that the reference is there to him or to the people around him yeah, because he seems to have been overtaken by some people around him. I, I'm not really sure. Keith? Okay, so now, you know, I hear your, your, my translation is this car is a strong donkey lying down between the saddlebags. Mm -hmm. When he sees that his resting place is good and that the land is pleasant, he will bend his back to the burden and will become a slave laborer. That's yeah. That's pretty much essentially what it says here. But so, what's the twist on a donkey versus you know? He's strong. The donkey's strong, mm -hmm. right? No, but donkey is also used for. Um, it's a servant. Yeah, it's yeah, a servant. Anyway. Down when you put the on it. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not a very good donkey to have when the, uh, the donkey you know crumbles when you put a bag on it. It's not a very good donkey. <laughs> It's not a strong animal for burning burdens. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, what do you What do you think about this uh, a Dan, this Dan being described as a serpent? Do you think that's indicating something? What do we know about Dan? Idolatry. Is this the seed of the serpent? Has Dan somehow been infiltrated and you know gotten himself under the thumb of the enemy? I mean, we know from our reading that Dan was one of the first tribes to introduce idolatry into the nation. So it, he could be a tool of the serpent. It's interesting the choice of words that he uses here. I think called. that word viper means like a false prophet, a lie, like you said, idolatry. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Christ called the, some of the people vipers and all this stuff. That's yeah. what he was referring to. A brood of vipers. Yeah. Is that like a band Liars of attorneys? And cheats and a band of attorneys, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tracy? I just wanted to throw this out there in case anybody knows. Um, Dan is the one that's not mentioned, one of the ones that's not mentioned in Revelation in the list, 7 yeah. about not being sealed. And I, huh. I don't understand that. That's so. a difficult like one. A that, uh, does anyone have any ideas about that? I know that has puzzled scholars for eons. About the, the reference here, Don, Don in Hebrew means a judge. Yeah. And um, well, who, who, the, which? Word, the word Nahash used in here 
There's other words used for snakes. Nachash is a reference to Hanachash is a reference to Satan in back in Bereshi, or Genesis uh, chapters what three four mm -hmm. when yeah. the snake. It's actually because it wasn't crawling. It's a serpent. It's a different kind of. A, it's not a thin crawling snake on the ground. Yeah, this is a legs. creature that's different. But it's a reference to the top. And it says he's like in the way, which is the yeah. same word as the way. Derek? Yeah. So he's a serpent in the way. A serpent in the way. A false prophet. That was what you said, right, Jerry? Yeah. Well, that certainly would kind of, if you stick those that type of wording together to say that this is a serpent in the way, uh, uh, that could interpret itself as a false prophet who is tripping up people. And of course we know that they did introduce idolatry into Israel, so I think that's a very valid interpretation. When, well, when John the Baptist was calling the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, snakes and vipers and all that stuff, yeah. he was talking about the oral law that he was teaching. Talking about, you know, not the Torah, but all the 5,000, 10,000. Right. Well, I, and I think that, that you, could be, you could be right. Uh, however, Yes, I would say, well, let me ask you this. Are the traditions of the elders bad? No, they're not from God. So they're not no, they're not, they're not. They were not given by God. But are, they tra are those traditions bad? Would it be bad to wash your hands before a meal? They're bad when you say that it's a sin to break down. Yes. But it's not a sin to break a tent one of the tent. <coughs> That's right. Commands. Okay, so these these things that they have added to the Torah <coughs> as the traditions of the elders, are those a sin in itself? No. No. no they're there's, a burden. They're, they're a burden. Yes, they are. And they would. It, I think it would be a sin to elevate them to a, the level of a commandment. But any one of them in and of themselves are not necessarily a sin. I mean, that's what God, Christ hated, was... I think, well, and, and I would beg to differ slightly, Jerry. I hope you don't mind. I don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think necessarily that, because I look at the way that the Messiah addressed the Pharisees and the leaders of the people, and, and it wasn't so much that he was saying, your traditions are horrible. He was more importantly coming against their actions and saying, you are hypocrites. You are play actors. You say one thing and do another. Now, yes, he did come down on their traditions and say, you have elevated your traditions to commandments and you have made them much more significant than they should be. And you have even set aside some commandments of the Father in order to hold to your traditions. But I don't see that as the key thing that the Messiah was coming against. More importantly, I see him saying, you guys are hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. That's what, remember the passage in, in, um, in Matthew, I, I could be wrong, 23, 25, where he's saying, the, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moshe. Right. Therefore, whatever they tell you, do it. But don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. Now, I know that some people have made the argument that the sitting in the seat of Moshe means that you've got to be, it, it, there's a, a, a problem there with that, that pronoun he, whether it's, and, and frankly, if you look at the most ancient extant copies of the New Testament that we have, there's only one copy that actually has the pronoun he talking about sitting in the seat of Moses. Therefore, what he, Moses, says, do that. Only one says that. All of the others say what they say to you, do it. So that's a, 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 that's a struggle for me because well, there's only one copy of the New Testament that says whatever Moses says, do it, but don't do what they do. That actually doesn't seem entirely clear because it seems to be saying whatever they tell you, do it, but don't do what they do. It was my understanding in Moses' seat they were supposed to read per diem what Moses wrote down. Yes, and I'm not suggesting that they did anything and, different. And he said, not, now, now do what they read, don't do what they do. <coughs> sure. That's, That's that, my understanding. That is, that is how a lot of people understand that. But the, the <coughs> pronoun there, whatever they say, do it. So yes, you could say, well, whatever they say in regard to what Moses said. So yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Well, that's what makes a hypocrite, those one who says one thing and does another. So right. So it's kind of looking at it that way. It's like, they're saying this, 
but they're doing something else. Right. They're and I and I just saw that maybe Messiah was coming against them a little bit harder on being hypocrites than just yeah, elevating their... That was, their, the leaven. that was the leaven of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. Yes. Right. So I think that's the, right. the big thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what, what, what do you think about this thing I put in here, underline in verse 18? Your, your Yeshua, I await, Yuva. I mean, that just sticks right out there like a sore thumb. Look, look, look. It's Dan. He introduced idolatry into the north. The north, its rider shall fall backward. The north was dispersed. What are they waiting for? To be remarried. Salvation. They're waiting oh, wow. for their salvation. Yeah. 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 That's, but are you referencing that, in, that it's a reference to Messiah? I believe so. Because it, to me, it just it's a feminine now meaning deliverance or salvation. Are you suggesting that this has no significance? No, I know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, but d d I mean, d clearly this is sticking out here like a sore thumb. Something is going on here. Now, whether this is a reference to Messiah, I would say certainly. I think it could be. Well, it's talking about the deliverance of Yahweh. So Your it, salvation. Yahshua, this is he deliverance. Is, yeah. He is a deliverance. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, the place that it's just stuck there and sticking out like a sore thumb... It, it, what is that suggesting to you? I really like what you said. Who said that a second ago? About the I do, Was it my beloved and gracious wife? What a... Lord. How quickly we forget. What's, that, what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell me. I know. <laughs> but that was delightful. You lovely and gracious woman, you. Yeah, very, very insightful. Um, I'm going to move forward. Going to Genesis 49, 22 through 26. A couple more tribes. This is Joseph. Interesting one here. A fruitful son is Joseph. A fruitful son. Joy of my eye. My son, inferior to me, has returned. And they were bitter with him and contended, and the archers were begrudging him. Yet broken in virility is their bow, and slack are the arms of their hands. From the hands of the sturdy one of Jacob... Fence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, from the El of your father and your helper, and he who suffices, and your blesser, blessings of the heavens from above, blessings of the submerged chaos reclining beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, blessings of your father and your mother. Master are they over the blessings of my mountains, unto the yearning of the Ionian hills. They are coming on the head of Yosef, and on the crown of the governor of his brothers." This one is a fascinating one. And as you can see, <laughs> Judah and Joseph are the ones that have the most Blessing. blessings and just rich outpourings <coughs> upon them. Now, uh, the they that were bitter with him, are we in agreement that that seems to be his brothers? That's referencing the, uh, the act of his brothers against him. I think that's probably correct. Um, notice that this is the first time in the Hebrew text of Elohim as shepherd and stone and rock. Those are certainly phrases that will come to you know bear more significance and be repeated more and more. And I mean, and we know uh, you know Yeshua is our rock in the stone, and of uh, the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, uh, which is interesting because that's so curious about these attributes being ascribed to the tribe of Joseph. You can almost see a weird dichotomy that is set you know here because we have some <laughs> language of Messiah attached to Joseph, well, we also have language of Messiah attached to Judah. I mean, is it, is it just because Mes that, that Joseph is, is, is a messianic-type figure in our story here? Do you think that's the extent of it? Hmm. Or is there more to it than well, that? Well, Yahweh loved Ephraim, but then Ephraim turned on Yahweh. Yes. So but now when Yeshua he comes it. back and he is regathering... That's what I was going to say. Zechariah 10, though, talks about this incredible blessing, though, that Yahweh pours out on Ephraim right in the end day. As the prodigal son right. from the time of Yeshua coming and regathering the scattered tribes of Israel. Right. Do, you know, you can, and Paul has, in Romans chapter 11, which we did finish studying a while back, 
seems like the tables have turned somewhat. And I think that that may be presaged here in this section, talking about Joseph having some messianic blessings as well. Not obviously that the Messiah is coming from the tribe of Ephraim or the house of Israel, but that the, the preeminence of the Messiah, obviously for the last 2,000 years, the eminence of the Messiah has been with the tribes of Ephraim and not with the tribes of Judah. The remnant, Sha'ari, the, fr- the remnant of Ephraim throughout the earth. Yes. Uh, has, a remnant has been preserved. Do you think that that is why some messianic type language is ascribed to the tribe of Joseph? Is that possible? I think so. I, and Joseph was also responsible for bringing the house back together. Right. So I don't. I mean, that's a for prophetic significance right there. There's other verses I think that kind of lead to his descendant Ephraim. Kind of, you know, what was that verse about the horns budding these people together? Yeah, there, I can't remember where it is now, but it talks about Manasseh and. Ephraim being the two horns that bring the people kind of together. pushing people together. Yeah, yeah. interesting, interesting. And, they, and I, there's something connection with them with, and Taurus, the, the mountain range of Taurus and the, the Pleiades. It's all like interestingly right. interwoven. Right, right, absolutely. I just wanted you to take note of the dual messianic prophecies that seem to be ascribed to Judah and the house of Ephraim, which I found to be very interesting. And it makes sense from a, from a historical prophetic significance because of what we know about what has happened with our people over the last 2,000 years. It, 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 it makes sense that there's a dual role there and that the house of Ephraim, in spite of the fact that they have gotten themselves into idolatry again by rejecting Torah and rejecting the ways of the Father, they are carrying that seed. It is not exactly a pure seed, but it is the seed nonetheless. And it is bearing fruit. I think you can see its fruit bearing. I want to say, you know, it's easy to say, well, nothing's really changed and the world's just as evil as it was before the Messiah came. And yes, you can say that to a certain extent. But you can also, can, can you guys see the blessings of Messiah? Has Christianity had any impact in the world since Messiah came? A lot. Oh, yes, absolutely, I think so. See, when I read the history of the Roman Empire, I see what's going on today. I don't think we're half as bad as they were. Yeah. I, mean, I may be wrong, but I mean, that sexual perversion. You know, a lot of people talk about that, that Jerry. Back in their days, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people talking. What we got. Yeah, there's a lot of people talking about, well, things are bad today, and other people say, well, you know, they're really not the same. I don't know where to come down on that yeah, argument, but I certainly think. You know, the, I think about the dark days of the medieval period and stuff like that, and religious superstition and weird stuff, and the Catholic Church infiltrating. We have the same thing, or even worse today, going on. But you have a remnant within the Christian Church, which is a seed of Ephraim, right. that have done good things. Sure. Okay? Now, but now we, we see a, a, with this uh, turning against within the Christian Church, a tremendous turning amongst different parts of the Christian Church that are really anti-Israel. We see the whole world turning against Israel. Yeah. And a lot of it is being supported by Christian, the Presbyterian, the Methodists, uh, Lutheran, Lutherans. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just... so. But, There's still that hatred for the brothers. Right, but on the other hand, you see the Christian people, a remnant within the Christian people, want to know the Emmet, the truth, mm. about what is what do these scriptures really say? And those are the ones, those are you people mm-hmm. who are searching and who want to know and want to follow Yahweh. And, and you, so you see these groups are all over the world today, gathering just like we're gathering on Shabbat and, and so forth and yeah. doing what we're doing. Yeah. So reference, here we are. Absolutely. We're here. Mike? <laughs> that reference to uh, Ephraim and Manasseh is when... Moses is giving the same blessings to each tribe. It's in Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, would you read that for us? Yeah, it says that, uh, referring to Joseph, at the end of the blessing. This is very similar to Jacob's blessing the tribes. Now Moses is blessing the tribes. Go for it. Yeah, read that for us. And at the end of the section where he's blessing Joseph, he says, His glory is as the firstborn of his ox. And the horns of the wild ox are his horns. With them he shall butt the peoples together to the ends of the earth. And they are the myriads of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Fascinating. 
That's a good one. I like that. He's hurting the people. <laughs> Very interesting. Jerry? Well, that word horn can mean king, authority. Sure. So that means he's going to be a pretty important person. Sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to move forward so that we don't get too far behind here. Um, looking at Genesis 49, 27 through 33, talking a little bit about Benjamin and then wrapping up with some of the other stuff here with uh, Jacob. Benjamin mentioned last here, Benjamin is a wolf tearing to pieces. In the morning he'll devour further, and in the evening he'll apportion the loot. He'll divide the spoils, Eurus might say. Um, notice that Benjamin is described as a wolf. Uh, what do you think about that? Tracy, I know you mentioned something previously about uh, Benjamin being a wolf. Yeah, I've got uh, three references about Benjamin tearing the prey, and it's usually in, in cahoots with a lion. So it supports that, the, the breaking of the houses of, the, of Judah and Benjamin going together, the lion and the wolf together. Um, Jeremiah 5, 6 is one. It says... Um, at night, you know, I don't know the context off the top of my head, but it's usually in admonition of how the Jewish people were not doing what they're supposed to be doing as far as setting forth the law. Sure. But this one says, Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. <clears throat> Everyone that goes out thence shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many and their black backslides increase. I don't know what that's about because I don't. Now, are you ascribing that to, you're just noting that it is mentioned as a wolf there, and you're wolf thinking the there might yeah, be a tie-in with Benjamin? Yeah. Okay. I think it, and I've read these in context, but I don't recall. Jerry, you want to throw something in there? The Apostle Paul jumped into my mind the minute you said that. Yes. Before Damascus. Right. Yeah, he was a ravening wolf, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, he was, going around persecuting and putting people in jail and beating them, yeah, absolutely killing them. Tracy? Yeah, Benjamin? Yeah. He, he was, was Benjamin. yes, he was. Very proud of Tracy? Um, this one is this one's a little bit more obvious because in Zephaniah 3, 3, but in verse 1 it says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city. It's talking about Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Yeah. So there's some sort of connection there. And then Ezekiel 22... 25 was the last one that I found. Throw it out. And that is back here. 22. Go ahead and read. 25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And who do you believe that that is referencing? Well, I think the top one was talking about Judah and the bottom about Benjamin, but I, I think it's this, this false Jew. Okay. I, okay, I see what you're saying. I got you. I got you. I'm beginning to wonder about the translation of this. It, it, you know, it says Benjamin is a wolf. Okay, meaning he's not a wolf, real wolf, but he's like a wolf. What does a wolf do? He goes out and he gets food, right? Yes. He's not so low. Now it translates uh, tariff here as ravenous. Um, that's not really, you know, a tariff means to. You know, to tear up your food, to tear, to rend, to pluck. Uh, he's get, he goes out in the morning, he gets his food, he tears it up and divides it, Boboker. It says he, um, he, he devours. In the word ochal, ochal means to eat. Mm. So they're putting these words in, they're taking liberty with these words, because he's going out and catching food, he divides it up, then he eats it in the evening. I, I, I don't get this. This uh, translation is very um, ravenous. Pizza yeah, you it's take wrong. exception to that? It's wrong. He, it says here, you know, and then he divides. It, and it does say shalal. Shalal is plunder. You know, 
Well, he's a so, plunderer. Well, that's okay. that's what it says in Ezekiel. Her princes in the midst are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. I don't know what that means here with this prophecy, but it seems to be connected to this scripture in Ezekiel. I would like to just draw your attention to two things. One, take note of the story about King Saul being the first king of Israel who was from the tribe of Benjamin. Right. And also the story about how the tribe of Benjamin was almost wiped out in Judges chapter 20 right. because they had injustice in their land. And it's very, very similar to what happened in Shechem that they there was a woman who got raped and her husband murdered and the people of the land knew what had happened and refused to exact justice. Mm -hmm. And the, the <coughs> sons of Israel um, basically said that uh, at the end of that, and judges, mm -hmm. uh, that they repented concerning their brother Benjamin and they said, one tribe from Israel will, has been cut off today. Yeah. I mean, they almost wiped out the whole tribe and they were forbid themselves to marry anybody. And remember, they conquered those one group of people and said, yeah, okay, you guys can marry the, into the tribe of Benjamin. But they almost killed their brother and wiped him out. That was a very difficult time for the tribe of Benjamin. Do you think that there's any significance to this time frame that is spoken about with Benjamin? In the morning, he'll devour, and in the evening, he'll apportion the loot? This, this evening and morning idea? Any idea about what that, any uh, significance you would attach to that? Those time yeah, frames. You eat breakfast in the morning. Do I, well, that, come on! Morning. Don't be so <laughs> literal. <laughs> don't be so literal. No, I mean, it, is anything about evening and morning? Nothing. Genesis. Just throwing it out there. Evening. The evening and morning in Genesis one one is interesting. Are there any prophetic significance that you would see with evening and morning? It's day, morning day, yeah, day, yeah, day, 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 Excuse me. It says morning evening, not evening. Sorry. Morning. Yes. Morning and evening. Boker, Arab. There you go. <laughs> I just wondered if it was something about early and later, something to do with the time frame of something of, of something to do with because uh, see he in the morning and let's say in an earlier time he devours and then later apportioning loot, dividing up spoils. Do you think there might? I th that's just an interesting thought, and I wanted to throw it out there to you. Do you think that dividing up of the spoils has anything to do with them? Uh, you know, it, it, to me, in my mind, it somehow related to, you know how when Joshua came into the land with the children of Israel and he divided the land up and apportioned them just as Moses had told him to do, it was instructed by the Father, that maybe there was some prophetic significance to, to, to um, a redemption for the tribe of Benjamin and that them having some type of a leadership role in the future of apportioning areas where there will be residences. Just an idea that I had. I don't know. It's totally off the wall, but I thought I'd throw it out there for your consideration. But, um, yes, sir. Maybe stupid question. I'm still so new. In there are no stupid questions. Um, if, if I read that last portion while we just started discussing about uh, Benjamin, mm -hmm. you can, of course, read it at, again, we talked a little bit about last week, in, uh, yeah. about different levels. Sure, sure. So you can read it on the first level from, okay, what does it really mean if we read at it with fresh eyes? Mm -hmm. But don't dig deep. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? From just a bit, just, just a just, shot level, yes. just level, surface when level? When you don't connect it to, okay, there when, it means this, and in the future it means that. What, right. What is he really saying to this son? Well, you know what seems weird to me is that he is saying this and we really have no reference at this time to Benjamin having done anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that we have is Joseph loves his brother. Jacob loves the youngest son. He's waiting for his brother Benjamin to show up. Benjamin has done nothing wrong. In fact, we have Benjamin not acting at all. Which is which? So I don't know what to do on the Peshat level and how to read that from a, just a literal you know, surface level because... He hasn't done anything. Uh, he certainly hasn't indicated and, and behaved himself as a ravenous wolf, at least not in the story so far. So Unless, okay, Joseph did give him five portions of food for his table, so maybe he ate like a ravenous wolf. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know. But ravenous doesn't really necessarily even fit the... Okay, he was story. hungry. Let, I'll put, let me put it that way. He, <laughs> he ate like a pig. The, his prey. Okay, get, An Angela is suggesting get past the food and the hunger. What do you got? That he's, whatever it is that he has, he is dividing it into pieces. And then he's 
consuming what he needs before he then distributes stuff to whoever else there is. So is he then a good person or a bad person? Because in one way it sounds like a horrible person, and in the other way it sounds like he's dividing the dead. Maybe what that's he has his in character, darkness. and in certain situations or, or historically it could be in a good way, and maybe other times it could be in a bad way. Right. Because because light always moves every character force. trait can be a positive yes. or a negative. True. True. Depending on what he does with it. True. All right, I'm going to move forward. Verse 28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father speaks to them when he is blessing them. Each man, according to his blessing, he blesses them. And instructing them is he in saying to them, I am being gathered to my people. Entomb me with my fathers in the cave which is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the double cave which is in the field adjoining Mamre, in the land of Canaan which Abraham brought bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a freehold for a tomb. And there they entombed Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I entombed Leah. The field was bought and the cave which is in it from the sons of Heth. And Jacob finished instructing his sons and he gathered his feet into his bed or couch and expired and was gathered to his people. He died and went on. I think that's a fabulous expression that is used in the Torah, being gathered to his people. I, I kind of relate that to, you know, in the bosom of Abraham. You know, I kind of make that connection. Do you guys? He was what, gathered to all the other ones that went before him, all his family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to just move forward and we no, can... Don't go to 20. I mean 50. Why? Because it's almost 9. It is, it is 9, 9 o'clock, but 50 is really small. The 50 is really small. There's not much going on there. I just wanted to wrap it up. Yeah. Really quick, I just wanted to point out how cool that Hebrew is, the Hebrew writing, and we kind of miss it in the English translation. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning of verse 28, it says, All these were the tribes of Israel. Most translations say 12 right. tribes. Mine actually says 2 and 10 because that's how the Hebrew writes it. 2 and 10, and the tribes were split. Isn't that prophetic? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Good point. Good point. Uh, I'm going to go to 50. This is 50 and 1 through 11. And Joseph fell on his father's face when he died, and he lamented over him and kissed him. And Joseph instructed his servants, the healers, to embalm his father. And the healers embalmed Israel. And they fulfilled for him 40 days. So they fulfilled the days for the embalmed. And the Egyptians lamented with him seven days, uh, excuse me, 70 days. And the days of his lamentation passed, and Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, Pray, should I find grace in your eyes, pray, speak to me, for me, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying that my father adjured me before his death, saying, Behold, I am dying in my tomb, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall entomb me. And now pray, I will go up and entomb my father as I swore and return. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Go up and entomb your father as he adjured you. And Joseph went to entomb his father, and all the servants of Pharaoh went with him, and the elders of the household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all of Joseph's household, and his brothers, and his father's household. But the young ones and their flocks and their herds they left behind in the land of Goshen. And both chariots and horsemen went up with him, and it came to be an exceedingly heavy camp. And they came into the threshing site of Atad, which is across the Jordan, and they wailed exceedingly great and heavy wailing. And he made mourning for his father seven days, and the Canaanites and the dwellers in the land saw the mourning of the threshing site of Atad, and said, This is a heavy mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore it is called Abel Mitzrayim, which is across the Jordan. Now I'm going to continue here. And his sons did for him as he instructed them, and his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, and entombed him in the double cave of the field, the cave which Abraham brought uh, bought for, with the field for a freehold for a tomb from Ephron the Hittite adjoining Mamre. And Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and, they, and all those going up with him to entomb his father after his father's entombment. And Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead and said, What if Joseph is holding a grudge against us and is reversing, yea, reversing to us all the evil with which we requited him? And they gave instructions to Joseph, saying, Your father gave instructions before his death, saying, you shall tell Joseph, O oh, bear prey with the transgression of your brothers and their sin, that with evil they requited you. And now pray, bear with the transgression of your servants of Elohim your father. And Joseph lamented as they spoke to him. And his brothers went and fell before him, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, You must not fear, for I am under Elohim, 
And you, you devised against me evil, yet Elohim devises it for good for me, that it may work out as at this day to preserve alive many people. And you must not fear. I'll sustain you and your young. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to their hearts. And Joseph dwelt in, in Egypt, he and his brothers, and all his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's sons to the third generation. Moreover, the sons of Machir, the sons of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying. Yet Elohim will visit you and bring you up from this land to the land of El- which Elohim swore to our forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath, proclaiming to the sons of Israel, Elohim will surely visit you, and you shall bring my bones up with you. And Joseph died, 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was placed in a coffer in Egypt. That is it, folks. That is the end of the book of Genesis. Um, now, just a, a couple of questions here. Um, you, you can notice here that, remember Joseph said that these sons of yours are mine? Talking about Ephraim and Manasseh, these are like my children. I think you can see here that the sons of Manasseh, for the sons of Machur, were born on Joseph's knees. You heard that expression before? It's just a little tidbit of information which I find to be interesting. You can kind of reference this back to um, like some woman who would be a concubine bearing sons for the wife and that she would actually sit on the wife's knees and give birth like it was symbolic of this is my child. You ever heard that before? <laughs> no, I don't want to hear it you. <laughs> no, I, have you guys never heard that? <laughs> that's what Sarah did with, uh, that's what Sarah did with Hagar. Is, it was my understanding from reading that is that when, it, when you wanted to, you see, like that, I don't know that that same thing happened with, uh, with Bilhah and Zilpah, but when you're bearing children for someone else, the, the child bearer would be on the knees of the person for whom they are bearing the children, and that is symbolic of this now belongs to me. So that's interesting. I just wanted to throw that out to you. Um, and this prophecy that Elohim will surely visit you and you shall bring my bones up with you. Um, just one of the last things that I want to throw out here is, you know, remember when number, in Numbers chapter 9, verse 6, when there were people, they were observing the Passover and there were men who said, well, we can't observe the Passover because we've touched a dead body. And so he set aside the 10th or the 14th day of the second month for them. Where were these dead bodies they were coming in contact with? Hmm. Was it the guys who went to get his bones? Huh? Was it the guys who went to get his bones? I think it was the guys who were carrying the bones of Joseph, who had been who had been in contact with the dead body and could not observe the Passover because they were carrying the bones of Joseph on leave of Exodus. Yeah. Keith? Okay, so in Exodus, when they went to, to leave Egypt, we know that they t- took Joseph's bones, right? Yeah. But they... Joseph promised Israel that he would go too. So did they take Jacob or Israel too? Well, that was part of what that, we just was that mentioned. Well, no, because he put. They actually went. Remember the whole the, a huge peep group of people went and buried him in in Hebron. So Jacob was buried in Hebron. When, when did they do that? Just I just read it. Just now. Did you okay. fall asleep? Yeah. No, they had the sons, and then yeah, they had for forty days. They embalmed him, and then they mourned for seventy days, which I think is representative of the okay. nations mourning for the children of Israel, which is the, the number of nations is seventy. I think that's fairly significant. Okay. Um, and so, what's interesting though is that they held this seven days of mourning on the east side of the Jordan, but then just the family, Joseph and his brothers, took their father across the Jordan and buried him in Hebron because Hebron is on the other side of the Jordan. Does it seem interesting that, or strange that it says Egypt mourned for him? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this guy, he just, he just moved there. Yeah, I know. And that was also interesting that, that yes, the heat, it was just like, obviously, there was a lot of Egyptians there, and the, the, the people living in the land of Canaan says, this is a great Egyptian morning, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that they all looked Egyptian, or at least, you know, many of them did. I don't know how much the brothers conformed, but we know that Joseph already was. 
Well, Joseph was such a you know yeah. uh, important you know figure to the Egyptians, so yeah. I'm sure when his father died, yeah, yeah, because yeah. absolutely, he was very yeah, yeah, and yeah. Very yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, so that's that's what we have, folks. Any other questions or comments on this section? We can wrap that up, have some more coffee, some food. And some food.